Hey guys, welcome to Telling the Told and Untold. My name is Toho. Before we go straight into today's video, I do have to give you guys a couple of content warnings. In this video, we do talk about S assault and children. I don't go into too much detail, but still, if that's not something you think you're interested in watching, then this video probably isn't for you. So maybe you can watch some of my other videos or just wait for my next upload. The killer had a signature. He would tie a cord around his victim's necks as tight as possible. And this is how he would get satisfaction and stimulus. It wasn't about the sexual assault. For him, the sexual assault was just a bonus. He would strangle them until they would lose consciousness and eventually they would die and he would still keep going. He would keep going until the blood vessels in their eyes would pop and their tongues would turn purple. The pressure from the strangulation would sometimes cause blood to gush, to gush out of their noses and mouths and he also had a distinguishing knot. It would be a double loop around the victim's necks and the knot would be in the center every single time. This knot would later be known as the Mazingani knot. For 15 months in the Nazrik area, young women had been found brutally raped and strangled. Police officers had no evidence to go on and they were at a complete loss. Sometimes they would find two to three bodies in the same area on the same day. Then, on the 6th of May 1996, 16-year-old Prudence Miller went missing. Every morning, she would say bye to her mother and she would cross the street to the prison that was there and she would climb a taxi and go to school. She attended Parktown Girls High School. Her mother described her as someone who was very bright and clever and all her mother really wanted for her was to have more opportunities than she did growing up. On this specific morning, Prudence never arrived at school and her body would later be found near the intersection of Sports and Nazareth Roads. She had been brutally raped and strangled. Following Prudence's murder, there was public outcry because she was younger compared to the other victims and because of this, police officers had more pressure to solve all the cases and they didn't know what to do or how to solve the cases. So this is when they decided to call in Pete Bailafault. Once Pete Bailafault came in, they handed him 10 murder dockets and it would take them four years to finally apprehend the Nazareth killer. It was clear looking at the dockets that mistakes had been made from the very beginning. Some evidence that had been found hadn't been taken for forensic analysis and there were just a lot of gaps in the investigation. Also, the investigating officers would tell the public everything. Every small detail that they knew, they would tell the public and left nothing to themselves. And because of this, the killer knew exactly what the police officers knew and if there was evidence they had found when he would go on to murder someone else, he knew what mistakes not to make. And sometimes he would even change his MO just so that police officers couldn't catch him. Also, looking at the dockets, you could see that the victims had similarities. All the victims, except for one, were wearing dresses and all of them had brightly colored nail polish. They were also described as very presentable women who were well-mannered and really like looked after themselves and their appearance. So basically, the perpetrator was attracted to women who wore dresses and had brightly colored nail polish. One of the victims' names was Bolinam Tangu and she disappeared on the 24th of March, 1996. When they were speaking to her seven-year-old son, he told them that his mom got into a taxi because she was going to the city to look for a job. And this raised the question of whether or not her disappearance had to do with her mode of transport. So maybe the perpetrator was a taxi driver. One of the victim's legs and arms were twisted and tucked underneath her body and there were pieces of clothing scattered everywhere. Her head had been bashed in and an iron bar had been found near her body. Some of the victims had scars on their bodies because the killer would cut their clothes off 
and some of the bodies had been found with them only wearing one shoe and the other shoe would be neatly placed next to them. All of the victims had been strangled with their own pieces of clothing, whether it be their underwear, a handbag, pieces of like their shirt, but it was all from them. The killer didn't come with anything to strangle them with. The cord would be wrapped around their necks a few times and there would be a knot exactly in the center of their necks. Bodies were found over a wide area, including Nazrik, Soweto, Southgate, Alexander, and Fosloris. And it was no doubt that it was the same killer because DNA evidence from the sexual assault had been taken in and all of them matched and it indicated that all of them had been killed by one person, the same exact person. The next question Pete Bailafald had was whether or not there had been any survivors. So as soon as he had this thought, he called so many different police stations and started asking them a couple of questions and from this he found six dockets and all of them had very similar circumstances. All six of the women were very well mannered, they really took care of themselves and at the time of their sexual assault they had brightly coloured nail polish and were all wearing dresses. Their perpetrator had been a taxi driver. All six women described the man as someone who was very short, he was in his early 20s, he spoke Sotho but in a very soft voice and he had like and like female underwear hanging on his review mirror in his taxi and when he would drive around he would just play music very loudly. So all of them described the same person who drove like the same taxi. So what the perpetrator would do is that he would pick the ladies up in the morning and then he would drop them off in the afternoon. And this would go on for a couple of months and he would kind of build like a, a relationship with him. So they would really trust him because they would see this person almost every single day. And then on one particular day he would be alone with them in the taxi and then he would drive to a secluded area like a felt and then he would force them out of his kumbi and he would tell them to undress and if they refused he would pull a knife out and threaten to kill him kill them and then after this he would push them to the ground and sexually assault them Whilst the Nazareth killer was operating, there was another killer on the loose. This killer had a different MO. What he would do is that he would put rocks in the middle of the road, like on the N4, and he would do this in broad daylight, but not during peak hours. So not like in the early hours of the morning, like 7, 8, when people are going to work and school, and not in the afternoons when they were coming back but like broad daylight and cars would drive and they would drive over these rocks and because of this they would have like a punctured tire they would have to pull over and this is when someone would come out from the shadows and threaten them and they would kill them and then steal their cars like basically hijack them in june 1996 a young married couple went to hartebias Wurtam for a calm sunday and they just wanted to enjoy themselves and as they were driving they drove over a couple of rocks and then they had to pull over under a bridge and this is when a young man came out of the shadows and offered to help. He then pulled out a weapon and ordered the husband to move over to the wife's seat, like the passenger side, and made the wife sit on her husband's lap. They also had a baby who was in the back seat in their car seat and this is when the baby started crying hysterically. The perpetrator then drove into a felt and then forced the couple out of the car. He made the husband go onto his knees and forced him as he sexually assaulted his wife. The baby was still in the back seat crying hysterically. During the ordeal, the man suddenly decided to stop and let them go and threatened to kill them if they went to the police and reported the crime. Afterwards, he took the car seat out from the back, put it next to the couple and then he drove off in their car. They also noticed that there was a man like in the shadows watching them as the perpetrator was sexually assaulting them and this also raised a question of whether or not this person had like 
an accomplice that they didn't know of. The perpetrator left one thing behind though, which was his semen. DNA evidence confirmed that the hijacker was in fact the Nazrik killer. Then, on the 24th of July, 1997, Gert Aspling, who was 66 years old, and his wife Elsie, who was 62 years old, were driving, and this is when they drove over a couple of rocks. The rocks damaged their tires, so they had to pull over, and this is when a man appeared from the shadows. Again, he pulled out a weapon and he was basically telling Khart to get out of the car, but Khart was very reluctant. He didn't want to because he didn't trust this guy and he just thought he was safe, but he wasn't. And this is when the perpetrator pulled out a gun and shot him and instantly Khart was killed. He then pulled Khart out of the car and just dumped his body on the side, climbed into the car and drove off and then he pulled over into a felt and then he took out a blanket, laid it down on the floor and then he pulled Elsie out of the car. Elsie was disabled, which is why she wasn't able to jump out of the car when he was driving off. He tried to sexually assault her, but she pleaded with him and he decided to leave her. He then got into the car and he drove off, leaving Elsie in the middle of nowhere. After this, he pawned her wheelchair and the next day, Elsie was found. A man was driving a tractor in the middle of the field and he heard a woman's cries. And this is how Elsie was found. For the four years that it took them to find the hijacker slash Nazareth killer slash taxi driver killer, Pete Bailafeld was beside himself. So I found it interesting to know that it's very hard to find a serial killer in South Africa because unlike other countries, our serial killers like changing their MOs. So you can draw up a profile about them and follow the way they kill people but then sometimes they like changing how they do it which makes it harder to find them and that is what it was like with the Nazra killer but it was also the same with the Wemapan killer whose case I covered I think last year so I'll link it up somewhere here so you guys can watch that to see how he would also constantly change his MO. Finally in 2000 there was a break in the case an attorney's wife was driving and she drove over a couple of rocks she had to pull over because her tires were damaged and whilst she was on the phone with a friend trying to get some help a man appeared from the shadows he sexually assaulted her but eventually he let her go and immediately she went to the police to report this case and somehow they managed to find the person who had sexually assaulted her. The perpetrator was later arrested and he pleaded guilty. He was then sentenced to 35 years for rape with aggravating circumstances. However, for some reason, Pete Bailafeld wasn't notified about this particular case. Even though the MO was exactly the same as the person that he was looking for. But as soon as he found out about this a couple of months later, he was so annoyed. Like, he was so angry, but immediately he drove to a laboratory. Like, you know, for DNA testing, so he could compare that person's DNA with his killer's DNA. And lo and behold, it was a match. And this is how the taxi driver killer was finally apprehended. And his name was Lazarus Tirizo Mazingani. At the time of Lazarus' arrest, he was 27 years old. He was born in 1973. His mom, Macy, had been arrested at the time of her pregnancy for selling Daha and I think some other drugs. So because she was arrested at the time of her pregnancy, Lazarus Lazarus was born in prison, so his first early childhood memories of are of him in prison and because of this he really resented his mom. Like he completely hated her. And even Macy herself, like she didn't have a good relationship with Lazarus, like she didn't try, like she didn't have any like maternal instinct, if that makes sense. 
Lazarus was raised by his grandmother in Brits before attending Deep Cliff High School. During high school, this is where he met a girl and her name was Nombi. And at first they were friends, but soon they started a relationship and they started dating. You know, they fell in love and eventually they got married. During their marriage, Lazarus would both physically and emotionally abuse Nombi. Sometimes he would bring women back home and he would tie Nombi up to the bed and then force her to watch him have sex with other women during one of his episodes he shot at her and this is when she decided to flee back to her parents house and she filed a report against him after this Lazarus Lazarus was so upset he was so angry with her that he kidnapped her and he brutally assaulted her throughout this period and eventually he decided to take her back home so he drove her in he drove her home in his kumbi he then opened the door and I think her dad was standing outside or her mom and then he just threw her body out and he started like swearing at them telling them to take back their child and then he started shooting at Nombi's parents, but fortunately no one was injured or hurt. Her parents tried to convince her to report him again, but she was so terrified because he kidnapped her the last time that she reported him that she just decided to leave it. After Pete found out who Lazarus was, he went to go see him in prison and then he decided to transfer him to the murder and robbery unit in Brixton. And whilst they were in the car, Lazarus, Lazarus was very confused and he kept asking like where they were going and why they were going to like the murder unit because he had pleaded guilty. But Pete just decided to you know, just keep to himself. He didn't want to say anything. He just wanted to see how Lazarus would react and just give him a couple of days before officially interviewing him. So he left Lazarus in prison and then he went home and Lazarus kept trying to see Pete. So they would constantly call him and be like, okay, he wants to speak to you. And Pete would just say, no, it's fine. After a couple of days, around like two in the morning, Pete Bailafelt received a phone call from the officers in the prison and Lazarus had defecated in his food and started throwing it at them. And this is when he decided to get into his car and drive to go see Lazarus. For months, Pete would ask Lazarus a few questions, just trying to get to know him and get him to open up about his life and his upbringing. And then on the 9th of June 2000, Pete took Lazarus to see his seven-year-old daughter for the last time outside of prison, as well as the daughter's mother. After this, Pete started putting a lot of pressure on Lazarus to confess to the different murders, but Lazarus, Lazarus didn't want to. And this is when Pete just started asking questions about like women in dresses and you know the colored nail polish and this is when Lazarus confessed to sexually assaulting them but not to murdering them like he didn't want to confess to that. After this Pete decided to ask him about Prudence Miller the 16 year old girl that he had killed in 1996 or so four years prior to this. And Pete just started asking questions like, oh, like, did she find her attractive? Like, what did she do to her? And Lazarus was so excited to be talking about Prudence that he kind of slipped up and confessed to murdering her. And then he told Pete that he would see Prudence's mother on TV just pleading with the public for, like, her return or any information. And after seeing her on TV, Lazarus called Prudence's mother up and said that he had information and wanted them to meet somewhere in Nazareth. And he said the reason why he called Prudence's mother was because he felt so sorry for her that he called her so that maybe she would bring police officers and they would find Prudence's body quicker. After Lazarus confessed to raping and murdering Prudence, he started confessing to all the other murders as well. And then he told Pete Bailafelt that sometime in the early 1990s, he had a taste for little girls and he couldn't control himself so he was in orange form and he sexually assaulted and killed four little girls as usual Pete tried to confirm this and there were dockers on these four cases but there was no hardcore evidence 
to convict him of these four murders of these children and even though he had confessed they needed more so it could be an airtight case so they ended up not going forward with those cases but Pete did call the parents of those girls to let them know well he couldn't tell them but like just to let them know that he's probably in prison and he hoped that they could find comfort in knowing that he wouldn't be able to kill other little girls again. Lazarus had a perfect checklist for his victim. So he said he liked them young, well-bred in a neat dress, preferably a working woman, no prostitutes, he was above them, someone who was submissive, people that were aggressive irritated him so that was a no-go women that had brightly colored nail polish and also women who wore high-heeled shoes in one instance a nurse's smart blue shoes led to her death so Lazarus would pick her up in a taxi and drop her off at the hospital that she worked in in Morningside so he would pick her up in the mornings and drop her off and this happened for a couple of months and eventually Lazarus asked his taxi boss if he could start working on Sundays so that he could pick up this nurse from home, drop her off at church and then take her home until eventually he decided that he couldn't control himself and this is when he eventually raped and murdered her. She would even tell her parents that there was this nice taxi driver who would like drop her off at work, pick her up and even take her to church on Sundays. And she thought it was so sweet but little did she know that all along he was just plotting her death. So remember the couple that had been hijacked and they saw an onlooker? Well, it turns out that Lazarus did have an accomplice and his name was Kaiser Muzehwa. He worked with Lazarus, but not really. He was very scared and frightened of him. So he did everything by force. And he also didn't participate in any of the sexual assaults because he was too sick with AIDS. Eventually, when he told the investigating officers what happened and how he and Lazarus worked together, he pleaded with them to put him in a different prison because he was so scared of Lazarus and what Lazarus would do to him. But eventually, he was found guilty, but he was only found guilty of robbery with aggravating circumstances. Lazarus Mazingane was a classic serial killer. He was the fifth in the legal history of South Africa. To so his immediate acquaintances and friends, he seemed like a really normal guy. He worked during the day and was also part of a social network and he had a really good circle of friends. Finally, the trial started and it lasted nine months with over 200 witnesses. Finally, on the 22nd of December 2002, Lazarus Tidizo Mazingani was sentenced to 17 life sentences and 781 years in prison. He was found guilty on the 74 of the 75 counts brought against him. And that's it for today's case. If you guys have any comments, please leave them down below. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, subscribe, and all that jazz. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye.